What's been interesting about, um, uh, maybe reintroduced, so again, I'm Vivian Ming, um, former academic turned uh, uh, sort of unemployable time waster slash entrepreneur. Um, and I have had a passion around doing education work for a long time. And that seems very uh, consistent with the fact that we're in a little bit of an ed tech bubble right now. Um, but it doesn't really capture why I'm interested in this space. And, and why, beyond that, I also do work, for example, recently as chief scientist for a company called Guild, uh, now as the CEO of, uh, of this education company, Socos. Um, why I spend time doing things like building models that predict whether my son, who's a type 1 diabetic, whether his blood sugar will go high or low. Uh, why at some time in the past I actually used a ton of Flickr data and techniques I learned from some upcoming speakers uh, to build a system for the UN uh, to model how people perceive faces so that it could be used to reunite orphan refugees with extended family members, uh, which is a surprisingly challenging problem um, given that you can't really bring technology to bear in the field. So what binds all of these things together? for me is an issue of human potential. Uh, what can we really achieve? And to really quantify that, I ask myself a question. What is the economic cost of unrealized human potential? When you think about inefficiencies in labor markets, when you think about underperforming schools, inequity in healthcare, untreated mental health disorders, just to name the ones that I kind of find myself dabbling in. Is it possible to actually quantify that? And of course, in the context of this room, what kind of tools can I, as a theoretical neuroscientist, machine learning person, actually bring to bear on these questions? Um, so let's start just with a story. Uh, this is one you all may have come across. It got a little bit of press. Some guy named Jose dropped the S out of his name and sent out resumes, and bam, got a whole bunch of additional responses. Right? So it's Joe versus Jose. Um, so when I was chief scientist at Guild, I had a database of 122 million people. And my job was to run a team that predicted how good all of you were at your job so that our customers could hire you and ideally hire you in some unbiased way that really is based on your skill set rather than what school you went to or how long your hair is or anything like that. Um, it's worth noting that the, uh, at least in initial versions of that product, the first things recruiters would do when they would open up your profile is look at what school you went to and where you worked before, which seemed to me like they were spending a lot of money on our product and then doing exactly what the product was meant to stop them from doing. Um, took a little work to figure out the UX to get that all right. But so I have this giant database, and I have this interesting question. Well, I pulled out every single Jose and every single Joe in this data set. So it ended up being about 100,000 Jose's, uh, 150,000 Joe's. Um, so what can we say? Well, what are some things that might be a little bit surprising? Turns out as a percentage of population, Jose is actually more likely to have an MD than Joe is. Uh, clear, we're talking Joe, not Joseph. Um, uh, what else is interesting? Well, Joe is four times as likely to reach the C-suite as Jose, uh, except in DC, where Jose is actually just as likely to be a CEO. Uh, those are all interesting questions, but I actually want to get at something a little bit deeper and, and sort of motivational for my work, which is this idea in economics of a signaling cost. What is the tax on being different? So let's say Joe and Jose are both software developers. OK, I, turns out I've got thousands of Joes and Jose's that are software developers. What is the signaling cost on Jose to be equally likely to get a promotion to senior software developer as Joe? Well, I've got a ton of data. I can go and look. I'm not going to make any causal attributions here. But it turns out the signaling cost, what is it that, that Jose needs, those extra things, the peacock's tail that will get him just as likely to get the promotion? Jose needs a master's degree or higher, at least in the educational domain, compared to Joe with no degree whatsoever. So now we have some established economic models we can use. What's the, what's the opportunity cost 
of six years of not working? And what's the actual financial cost of that undergraduate degree and then the master's degree on top of it? Um, that's really sort of shocking. That's substantial. That we collectively waste the resources, if you take it as such, that Jose has to spend just to get the same outcomes, produce the same contribution to society as Joe. Um, and these are the kind of things that we were battling at Guild. Um, and I'm not there, but I still love the company and, and uh, certainly have high hopes that all of your companies are using them now. Um, if you're just curious, let's uh, say, to get it out of the way, that for women, it's roughly a master's degree versus a bachelor's degree. So considerably less as a large population, but still very real, very measurable. Uh, and we even went in and, and, and had fun answering some questions. Uh, did it matter that Tim Cook came out? Well, turns out there is actually some genuinely interesting results about what the signaling costs are for people to grow up in inclusive environments, such as a young gay man might growing up in Alabama. Um, I will leave all of that aside, because again, we've got someone we actually want to hear from, and say that this is a big motivation to me. This idea that we find it acceptable, at least passively, in allowing these kinds of, to be bland about it, inefficiencies in our economic system to persist, to be much more strident about it, we, that we allow this kind of ridiculous bias to persist in the world when, at least in the ideal, the kind of algorithms that we're talking about here and many others might provide a better path to doing an unbiased assessment of human potential. So, let's get out of HR for just a moment and talk about education. Um, I founded Socos on a belief that uh, education is not a broken system. Think of all the people that enter the American, much less the world education system, and come out the other end able to do things. I think it's amazing. Um, but the idea that we couldn't be doing better is obviously pretty laughable when in, for example, the models we built at Guild, uh, your preschool is a stronger predictor of your life success than your college. Um, no knock on any of you with a Stanford degree, but it turns out uh, that degree didn't add a lot of additional value to your uh, skill sets, um, although maybe some wonderful times and some great network connections. But really, the reason I want to hire someone from Stanford is the reason they got into Stanford in the first place. It's deep qualities about them. And we use a terminology, a blanket terminology called meta-learning to describe that broad set. This has gone under terminology such as 21st century skills, as though you wouldn't have wanted them 200 years ago, and, and they will be obsolete in the 22nd century. Um, Non-cognitive abilities, grit, motivation, emotional intelligence, there's a huge, vast set of these qualities, which it turns out are the things that are actually predictive of success in the workplace. They're predictive of how long you'll live. They're predictive of how much money you'll make. They're predictive of how happy you'll be, which is an interesting, uh, quality, that all of these things, to some degree, can go together. Uh, and that, given the literature, we can actually identify them in four-year-olds. You may all be familiar with this idea of the marshmallow experiments, that a marshmallow in front of a four-year-old, ask the kid whether, uh, you know, if you can wait 20 minutes, I'll be back. If you haven't eaten it, I'll give you a second. You get two marshmallows. And uh, the cruelness of this particular experiment is you wait till every kid breaks. And then they all get the marshmallows. So it's like you give them completely the wrong lesson in life. Um, but it is highly predictive. The kids that wait the longest will do the best in school. They will go on and make more money. They'll get the best jobs. Well, if we can do this at four years old, and presumably it's a fixed trait, then let's just do this. We'll send the ones that wait 20 minutes to Kinder Harvard. The rest of them will give them little plastic shovels. They can practice digging ditches, because okay, get good at your job. Um, but that's junk. These are not fixed qualities. Certainly people are genuinely different in the world, um, but there's a lot of variance, and unfortunately I don't have the time to go into all of these really cool variants and the research around it, but turns out these are genuinely intervenable traits. As a machine learning person, I tend to think of it as 
as rational behavior as defined by Bayesian model. These kids are d displaying rational behavior. And it turns out with little tweaks in this experiment, you can get the, the ones that wait the longest to eat the marshmallow right up front. Um, so if we can intervene on these things, why don't we? And along similar lines, if we know that these are what's predictive in life and grades and standardized test scores, and even the schools you went to, not only from my own research, but from you know, famous public statements out of Google, for example, and Laszlo Block and others saying, these aren't predictive of anything, and they aren't. So uh, I'm very proud that uh, NIPS one year, I published a paper that said we could take the free-form interactions between students and discussion forums and predict the grade they get in the class at week one. And then I spent two years building models that told me that those grades I just predicted don't predict anything later in life. So, God, what a waste. So what do we do at SOCOS? We take naturalistic student data. If anyone here actually is from the theoretical neuroscience world, I'm borrowing that term. This is all the data students naturally produce when they're learning, when they're talking to one another, when they're sending emails, they're doing their homeworks, staying away from standardized tests, uh, staying away from computer-mediated environments, which are becoming more naturalistic, but still not. We take that and not predict the grade in the course, but predict those students' life outcomes based on that naturalistic data. And then using that prediction, drive intervention recommendations back to the student, to their teachers, to their parents. So to give you one very concrete example, and to, I think, clarify why I'm here and why I'm interested in deep learning technologies is a project we're running jointly with UT Austin with sets of kindergartners in uh, their migrant kids in English immersion classes. And the only signal we're getting out of those classes is from a microphone. And in our case, right now, it's a single microphone, which is incredibly painful. From that, we're collecting all of those voice interactions between the five-year-old and the other five-year-old in English and Spanish between the, the child and the uh, teacher. We're going to expand this out to run on the playground, and we even have permissions to do it at home. So we're collecting all of this rich audio data. Turns out you can sample this. You grab 30 seconds every 10 minutes, and that's uh, about enough to actually get a real rich uh, sampling and understanding of who's saying what, in what language, at what sophistication, and to whom, um, and build social networks out of that. And from that, we drive through, and in there, there's every machine learning hack I could possibly come up with to get the system um, to work in production, is a system that spits out, uh, in essence, a tw uh, text. We want this to get to work in classrooms. I don't have the luxury of being able to ex expect everyone's going to process a dashboard or understand a distribution or anything like that. We send a single text home to their parents every single day. Here's the one thing you can do tonight that will have the biggest impact on your child's life. So for example, hey, Maria is really interested in seahorses right now. Dad, take 15 minutes, talk to her about seahorses bite size, right there. You get it, you act on it. And in fact, everything about that text I just described was highly specific. The seahorses is obvious. We've picked up on that from the audio recordings and her discussions over the last week with the teacher and the classmates. But dad, what if you were, now I gotta get wonky, we're looking for endogenous motivation. This is the intellectual curiosity of the learner. What if you were a little girl, genuinely interested in seahorses, and then your dad, who it turns out is not deeply involved in the education aspects of your life, just spontaneously asks you about them. What an amazing reward that would be. The kind of reward that is uniformly missing across a lot of uh, student populations. Um, and, uh, and on top of that, everything. Talk to her about it. Don't read a book. We'd rather have rich Spanish than poor English. Focus on what's actually gonna drive not just her success in the moment, but her long-term life outcomes. So we're cutting it real short, and we're gonna move on to the next speaker, but I really wanted to convey this idea that the kind of things that we're developing here and the technologies that you all are talking about are things that can truly change the experience of a child. 
Uh, and in answer to the question, uh, based on our estimates, which are similar to others, in the US education system alone, uh, the improvements that are available via interventions like this are on the order of 1.3 to 1.8 trillion dollars a year, 20 to 30 years out. So that's what we leave on the table, and that's what the kind of work that we're all talking about here can actually support. So thank you very much, and I am going to transition very quickly now. Please track me down if you have any questions. I would love to answer them. But I'm going to transition uh, very quickly into our next speaker, who I could go on and on as work at the Stanford AI Lab and the notorious cat detectors for YouTube uh, and um, a little education company called Coursera. Uh, and now as chief scientist at Baidu, I I think there's very little that uh, Andrew hasn't touched on that we all wish we had done. Uh, and uh, he's going to come up and have a conversation around some of the amazing new work which is already coming out of the lab. One of uh, Redwood Center's uh, students has joined his lab uh, at Baidu already and is already bragging and we're all jealous. So Andrew, please come on. <laughs> 